Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. You little people of the tube. Hope you're well today. Hope you're feeling grand when you're world. Welcome to the final Q&A Wednesday of 2017 until 2018. If that makes any sense. Anyway, let's get on with question one, shall we? So question one today is, I've learned the five positions of a scale, but I find it difficult to navigate through them during a solo. Do you have any advice on how I can do this easier? Um... I mean, I mean, I mean, navigating through the, the scales kind of like you know up and down the neck really comes down to it, it, it's more more than anything it, it's kind of like time you know and, 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 and kind of like um, repetition if you know what I mean and, and obviously kind of like and, and stealing other people's licks Shh, don't say anything um, but no it, it really is it's kind of like you know um Flow it going flow through the scales. I mean, that's it's really difficult to answer that question because, um, yeah, it's really difficult to answer that question actually. I mean, my my advice is, that, I mean, if you know the scales, but you're having difficulty navigating through them, um, could maybe say maybe, maybe say to me, uh, maybe you're not taking enough kind of time. Maybe you're trying to rush it. I don't know. I mean, I could be totally wrong with that assumption, but. Like, I know, I know. For instance, from my perspective, when I first learned my Pentai scales, oh, learned my scales and whatnot, I would rush and try to play really kind of like you know super fast. And through doing that, I would get lost very quickly, and and kind of things wouldn't flow, and I wouldn't be able to kind of like understand where I was. So one thing I would say is always kind of like if you're trying to navigate solo, uh, so through scales where you're soloing, is to kind of slow down. You know, really, even if the song's blasting at like you know a million BPM, you know, really go slow and just kind of take your time and and just find what notes fit where and kind of log that. Like if you've got like a progression, like you know, like the uh, let's do it. So that's you've got that progression. And like you know, you you're going into it kind of like you know with your with your pentatonic uh, scales, and this is in D minor, um, and you're kind of getting you know you're struggling to kind of navigate through those scales from kind of one end to the other. Just slow down and just literally kind of like do a note per quarter, say, and find out what notes you like the sound of. So for instance, something like this. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's a difficult question to answer because it really is down to just repetition and feel. I, and I, I don't personally believe something like that is, 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 is capable of being taught. It's a something you get through just playing. It's not something that you can kind of like, um, you know, you can't say learn this, learn this, and learn this, and, you, and you're there. It's um, navigating through scales and creating a solo that flows and doesn't sound rushed and it's just very, very comfortable. It just comes from um, playing and experience and, and just kind of like keeping at it in repetition. There's no way you can rush it with, with anything with guitar. You can't rush anything on the guitar. If you rush it, you're not going to learn from it. You, you, know, you need to earn that kind of like knowledge you're going to get through kind of like you know thingy so you've learned your pentatonic scales so you've earned that so that's really cool um but now what you've got to do is you've got, you've got to kind of like you know learn and and and, and how to kind of like fit them together in a sense that makes in, in a way that makes sense to you and uh your ear and what you want to hear and what you want to convey with those scales um if that makes any sense i hope that makes sense it, it, it's like i say it's a difficult thing to answer stuff like how to navigate through scales because everybody learns differently there's not there's not a single way that i could teach anybody anybody and it would work for everyone it wouldn't work that way everybody learns differently and everyone kind of like develops in a different way so it's really difficult to kind of answer a question like that but that's what i would say do is with a chord progression and if you're struggling to kind of like navigate through solids slow down 
as slow as you can go and just like you know restrain yourself kind of down to like you know really slow with it and just see what notes work where and forget why they work just kind of like you know i like that note there because it sounds nice to me so to say and through doing this you'll log kind of runs so to say in your head you'll kind of like log stuff like me go back to that chord progression you'll get something like this <laughs> That was going through all five positions of a pentatonic scale in D minor, coming out of D minor, and that's just a run. But I know those notes work. That, well, I don't. I don't know why they work. I just know they work, and I like the sound of them. They sound melodic, and they flow nicely over that chord progression. So that's what I would say to that. Really, is just literally, just keep at it. Just kind of slow down, pick notes, find what you like, and eventually it'll just become second nature, and you won't think about it. You'll just play. But you've got to kind of like, um, you've got to kind of like, you know, you've got to earn that through the hours of just like, you know, putting in practicing, you know, uh, just learning your, your scales is kind of, it's kind of like, you know, this step one on the, on the ladders, really. It's like, it's like learning the alphabet, you know, if you, you know, A, B, C, D, you know that, but it's, you know, now you've got to kind of like, you know, put words together out of those letters kind of thing, so to say. So it's the same thing with scales. Uh, navigating through them, it just takes time muscle memory and eventually you'll get a feel for it and you'll just play how you feel but it, it's not something that you can rush or you'll get in a week or in a, in a couple of a couple of weeks it'll it'll take time and it takes a lot of um a lot of patience to kind of get to it so to say anyway um but yeah i mean that, that's that really i mean that's what i would recommend anyway i mean um people feel free to chime in in the comment section below but that's what I would say. Just like slow things down, find what you like, find what sounds right to you, and go with that really more than anything. And through that, you will find your way of navigating through the scales. And that's what I mean, your way, not anybody else's, not my way, not somebody down the road or the guitar teacher. It's your way. And through doing it your way, it'll make more sense. If that makes any sense, I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm just rambled on for like five minutes about nothing. Uh, you also asked, who do I think is the most underrated guitarist and why? Ah, uh, um, that's a difficult one. Um, I think I don't know. I mean, it's really difficult to kind of like pinpoint one guitarist I can think of who's really underrated. I would say somebody like J. K. Lee, because I really like J. K. Lee. But then again, I mean, I, I would. Almost in this day and age, it's kind of weird to say, I know, but I would almost class Rory Gallagher as an underrated guitarist. Because Rory, as much as it, Rory's got a big fan base, but unfortunately he is kind of forgotten quite often within the scheme of things. I mean, he's never been... Um, one of the things I find quite disgusting, he's never been like nominated to be inducted into Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Rory, and I think that's just wrong because Rory should have been in there from day one. Um, you know, but I think Rory kind of gets overlooked. Um, people will tend to kind of like maybe look at Richie Blackmore or Jimmy Page or, or, or Pete Townsend or people like that. And I feel Rory kind of, kind, of, kind of gets like pushed aside a little bit. And I don't particularly like that. There's also Stan Webb from Chicken Shack. He was an amazing guitarist as well. Amazing British blues guitarist. And the sound, oh insane but um dick dale but i, I suppose he don't really can get overlooked he just kind of like you know but i would say kind of like you know you do, it's funny how much how much you'll mention rory and, and sometimes people won't know who he is and i find that a bit kind of disconcerting really because rory was literally when you watch footage of him back in the 60s and, and the early 70s was just an absolute force to be reckoned with on guitar. So, um, and I, I, I know he's not 100% kind of like underrated because people do, like I say, he's got a big fan base and he's very kind of rated as a guitarist, but I do feel he gets overlooked. So, that, and also people like Mike McCready uh, from Pearl Jam, um, Jerry Cantrell, a lot, a lot of grunge guitarists I feel are kind of overlooked um, for certain things. I mean, Jerry Cantrell is just like, incredible. Jerry Cantrell had one of the most amazing lines of advice I've ever come across, uh, which was 
um, when, when learning the guitar, you, you, you eventually reach a crossroads with guitar. One way leads to technical ability and being able to shred your head off and just being like technically brilliant at guitar. And another way leads to being able to write songs or being able to play feel-based music. And he says, when you get to that crossroads, when you're playing guitar, you have to go for one or the other. You can't go for both. You have to sacrifice one. So if you want to be a technical guitarist, you have to go that way, but you sacrifice your feel and ability to can maybe kind of write songs or, or write, you know, things like that slightly. And the same thing, if you go that way, you'll sacrifice your technique a little bit because, you know, this and the other. And that always stuck with me as I thought that was really kind of very, um, I don't know, very true. I just felt that was very true. Anyway, I, I rambled off long enough, but like, I would say that, you know, the people I've spoke about are kind of like, you know, my underrated guitarists and kind of why, but I do feel Rory kind of gets overlooked a little bit too much. And, um, I mean, I, I'm probably wrong and I'm probably well out of line saying that, but, but to me, that's that's the way I feel. I mean, people I think would rather kind of, I say, look at people like Richard Blackmore and, and Jimmy Page and like, uh, and instead of like looking at Rory and, and what Rory did, but to me, Rory is just something else. He really is something else. There was something about that man who was just un unreal, unreal guitarist. Anyway, we have to move on to question two because I'm ram I'll ramble on about that all day and I don't want to boil to tears. So I hope I've answered your question about Pentine scales and like you know just, just learn runs that you like and just kind of like develop in your own time and just take your time and don't rush it. The moment you rush it, the moment you're not going to learn. So uh, yeah, I'm going to move on to question two now. Okie dokie. So question two today. Uh, involves this little beauty here. So, uh, question two is, I'm trying to find a really nice guitar I would like to own for the rest of my life, and I'm looking at Nick Oswald's guitars. How would I compare your Oswald Strat to a custom shop Fender, or even my vintage Strat? Um, I would put this up there with some of the best custom shops. I've played a lot, luckily, through working at Old Hat, I've played a lot of custom shop Strats. I've played a lot of 50s replicas, custom shop ones, Kind of one of a kind replicas. I, I got to play a exact replica of a 54 Strat, um, and the build quality of that one is no different to the build quality of Nick's. They are, you know, I would put this against any custom shop Strat any day of the week happily because it's just unreal. And in February, I'm going to do a little, like a like a a, a close-up catch-up video with this guitar because I've played it that much since I got it that there is there is paint chipped off it. <coughs> I am going through the finish where my plectrum kind of scratches on the finish. It's been, you know, it's battered and beaten a little bit, but and it's all kind of like starting to check and the finish is starting to check and it's just really starting to get worn in. Um, but this Nick's guitars are just unreal. They are absolutely unreal. I mean, I, when he sent me this, apart from being the luckiest man alive for having this, because I am, and I, I don't, I don't know what I did to deserve it. But when I play this, it's just, it's just unreal. It's one of the easiest guitars I've ever played in my life, and like I say, it's just up there with any custom shop stuff, any custom, anything. It, this is up there with that. It just is the build quality, everything about it. It's just solid, absolutely solid, and it's just amazing. So, I mean, I, I, I would recommend Nick's guitars any day of the week over a custom shop because I feel that custom shop strats can be a little bit too pricey for what they are sometimes. Like the Gary Moore, like eight grand for the Gary Moore Fiesta Red replica. I think that's just that right outrageous. I think that's just absolutely outrageous money. For a, uh, a replica guitar like that, I think it's just ridiculous. I mean, you could probably go out and get like, you know, you could get like a bits of strat and relic it yourself to look like that, or even better, get Nick to do it for you. Um, you know, it, it literally like that. I mean, but yeah, I mean, I can't recommend Nick Nick's guitars enough. I really can't. I mean, this one will be with me till the day I'm not here anymore, and then it'll get handed down to whoever whoever gets it after I'm gone, whoever I leave it to. And it will literally just be around for years and years and years as well. And it feels like that as well. It just, it just feels solid. Absolutely, absolutely pro proper, so to say, if that makes any sense. So, I mean, I'd highly recommend it. If you're going to go 
through guitar you are in for the rest of your life. Contact Nick, give him your specs of what you want, and you know, and and, and like you know the the neck measurements, the color. You know, do you want it kind of like you know, you know, hardtail, tremolo, Telecaster, whatever. You know, what 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 do you want it to be? And I would I would talk to him more um, because you're gonna get what you want instead of kind of like. I know you can kind of go to like Fender and you give them me your kind of specs and they'll build it, but Nick just just has something else. I don't know what it is, but it's in this guitar and it was in the Safari he lent me for a while, and <coughs> they're just unreal. They are just unreal. I would really recommend it. I'd recommend emailing him and and just and just seeing what he says, uh, seeing what you know, seeing what he says about what you want because. I love this guitar so much. It really is. It's just one of my main guitars. I mean, it's just one of those guitars that if it got stolen or broken, I would absolutely be, oh, I'd be so depressed. It would be the worst, one of the worst days of my life if anything happened to this guitar. And I love it to bits. And it's just, and like I say, it's just starting to get played in now. After playing it since since February when I got it, it's just starting to get kind of really worn in now and really starting to kind of start to get broken in and it's just feeling and just feels wicked so i, I would recommend i would recommend nick and like i said i'd happily put this up against um one of the custom shop fenders any day of a week it's up there with the best this is it really is to me um you know it really is so um so yeah um as it compares to the 62 i mean i really can't really compare anything to the 62 the 62 is the 62 but I've got to say the neck on this guitar is a lot like the 62. It feels a lot like the 62. It's very, very strange, very strange. And the way it kind of like um, the neck kind of uh, the neck kind of goes seamlessly into the headstock is is very like the 62. Um, but I just love this guitar. It's just amazing. And like I say, any any day of the week I put it up against any custom shop, happily. But yeah, anyway, uh, I hope that's answered your question on that. Anyway, I'm going to stop gushing about Master Nick now. And uh, I'm going to move on to question three. But yeah, I'd highly recommend all four guitars. Absolutely amazing. Okay, hey, question three. Okie dokie, question three. Uh, quite interesting one. Uh, is, it better, is it better to anchor your right hand or not? And is it better to anchor it with the with pinky or the palm of your hand? Right, um, you said there was quite a bit of discussion about this on the internet. So what I would say about this is... Do whatever feels comfortable. Forget internet forums, forget people telling you, forget, you know, some great guitar, like copying some guitarist. If it feels good to rest your hand with your little finger and play like that, then do that. If it feels good to rest with all three fingers and play like that, play like that. If it feels better to float your hand like a gypsy jazz guitarist would, you know, play like that. And gypsy jazz guitarists like Django Reinhardt, they never rested their hand. It floats. It's the weirdest thing in the world. But if you watch people like Django Reinhardt, there's some footage on YouTube or Borelli the Green or people like that. They float their hand. And I can't do it for the life of me. And also the plectrum is kind of like, they hold the plectrum in a weird way. Like, and they play like this. Um, my brother, who's like a really, really awesome gypsy jazz guitarist, he can do that kind of thing but I, I can't for the life of me but they float the hand they don't anchor their hand at all it just floats and just goes over strings and I don't know if that's the re I don't know if that's the reason they can play so fast and so fluidly I don't know but it literally comes down to what feels good to you I mean it, it, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I don't really know what I do I mean I don't really analyse myself that much but I know for a fact that the wear on on the guitars, um, especially my white strap, which I've had the longest, the screws uh, on the middle pickup, bottom bottom pickup, uh, middle pickup, bottom screw is worn away, and the uh, bridge pickup top screw is worn away, which means I'm kind of like doing both, almost in a, in a way. I mean, I, don't, I really don't know what I do because, like I said, I don't overanalyze myself, but I know I rest my my little finger quite a lot. I mean. <laughs> It's mainly those two fingers, mainly my little finger, but that one comes in every now and again to anchor. If I look at look at what I'm doing, so it's it's the same as anything. Do what's comfortable for you and forget what anybody tells you, because 
I feel there's there's far too much of the um, oh this is the right way to do it I know it's the right way because I do it there's far too much of that it's playing a guitar is such a physical kind of like thing you have to put a lot of yourself into it it's literally down to your you as a person to what you do not what somebody else tells you I mean you look at some I mean, if you look at some people's technique, like, for instance, like, uh, Mark Tremonti, when he shreds, his technique is bizarre. It's really bizarre. He kind of, like, has, like, a, a fist. Or Gary Moore. Gary Moore had this weird kind of, like, hand flailing technique. When he plays really fast, his hand kind of, like, flails out like a claw almost. Um, uh, Marty Friedman, he's got a very strange technique as well. He's almost like that. Uh, Steve Morse, again, very, very funny-looking technique. Um... You know, people like Jimi Hendrix and John Shanty are kind of a, a funny looking thing as well because it, it, it's literally their personal technique that works for them so whether you're anchor your hand or not is literally down to how what feels comfortable for you more than anything else over anything, over internet forums and what people say is right or wrong it's down to you I mean if you literally want to play with you know, your, your hand like this and play with your thumb there's no rules that says you can't. I mean, I'm pretty sure there was a blues guy who played like that. I mean, there's no rules to say that's wrong. You know, I'm anchoring my hand underneath the guitar. You know, technically I might not even need a strap. I could just, like, just play it regardless. But it really is a personal taste thing. It's down to you. It's about finding what you like and forgetting what people say. Um... And I can't really stress that enough, that is really important with a guitar, is just forgetting what people tell you is right or what is wrong and going with what works for you, regardless. Um, Eddie Van Halen would tremolo pick with his um, plectrum between his thumb and his uh, middle finger, like that. You can see him doing it, and it's, it's weird. I can't do it, the plectrum just goes, Wah! I'm off. Um, so it's literally down to kind of like doing what's comfortable for you and what works for you. So uh, whether you want to make a hand or not is totally down to you. I prefer to, but sometimes I don't. It depends on how I feel at the time. It, it, it doesn't it doesn't really enter my mind, so to say. I mean, it feels a bit weird not to anchor my hand, but there are certain occasions where you need to kind of... Like, you need to do the Paul Gilbert, Pete Townsend thing. Or do the Paul Gilbert faces. <laughs> Look, Paul Gilbert's face is amazing. Anyway, yeah, um, but like I say, yeah, do what's comfortable for you. Forget everything else. You know, forget the internet forums of people telling you it's wrong or this, that, and the other. Do what's comfortable for you. Find your own way through it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is really down to personal preference. Guitar is personal at the end of the day. It's not that. It's not down to anybody to tell you how to play it other than yourself. So, um, so yeah, anyway, how about answer your question? Uh, moving on to question four now. Okie dokie. Um, I'm going to try and keep question four short, as you asked quite a few questions, and the first one I could ramble on for hours about. So I was going to keep it simple. What do I think of musician, and would I use it? <sighs> I was dreading the day this question might come up. Do I, what do I think of musician? I think it's a good way for people to cash in on people wanting to learn an instrument and not for the right reasons, in my opinion. Musician is not the quick and best way to master an instrument, like it says it is. I, I find that really insulting, personally. Um, you're not going to master an instrument in a quick and easy way. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. You know, and I find that really offensive that they can put that out there because it gives the wrong impression to people. People go, oh, I've always wanted to learn to play guitar, but it's really difficult at the start, like they say in the adverts. And then I found a musician and I could just play. No, you can't. No, you can't. You know, you, I, I, you, know, you, can't, you can't teach somebody how to play the comfortably num solo a week after they first started picking up a guitar. It, it's not going to happen. So I find a musician a bit of a, a silly website, really. I mean, it's stupid. And I don't like their, their, their tagline there. It's easy to learn and master an instrument. No, it's not. Give over. You know, people... There's, there's, a, there's a quote. Um, there's a quote from a, 
a japanese quote from a samurai which is you never stop learning no matter how old you are you're never going to stop learning in what you want to learn you know and for us that'd be the guitar we're never going to stop learning different new things on the guitar ever to the day we are no longer here we're never going to stop learning interesting weird things about this instrument it's just not going to happen you're not going to go one day you're not going to just learn one thing one day and go right i know it all because that's just not going to happen and the musician is kind of saying that if you follow their courses you'll you can you'll know everything and you'll master the guitar and you know or the drums or the bass or or you know whatever and you know just give us this amount of money and you'll and you'll you'll do it which is nonsense and it's kind of like it's kind of del it's kind of deluding people into thinking that's possible and i don't like that and I find it, like I said, I find it massively offensive for guitarists who have sat hours and hours and years and years and, you know, countless struggles to kind of play the way they, you know, to, to get to their ability. I think it's kind of like, you know, like, you know, just kind of like belittling that in a way. It's like saying, well, you know, Jimi Hendrix, we can teach you to play like him in a week. Nothing. I'll tell you, it's really easy. Really. Um, so I, I take massive offence to the musician. Every time an advert pops up on YouTube or something, I'm just like, I die a little inside. It just makes me cringe, especially that tagline, learn and master an instrument. It's like, you liars. So just to come back to the question, would I ever use musician? Not, not if it was the last thing in the world. I'd rather throw myself off a cliff. Um, bold statement, very bold statement. But I, I'm, I feel very strongly about it and I don't like musician at all I really don't like it I feel it's like I say it deludes people and it, it, it kind of it leads people in the wrong direction totally and it's it's totally not what learning an instrument is about musician musician is about that company earning money off you that's all that is they ain't going to teach you anything they're just going to like take your money and then at the end of the year you go about well why can't I play like that yet and they're like well not our problem we did the 15 step course you know it's, it's like you know get lost it's just a big corporate rubbish that's what that is very passionate about that but yeah would i ever use it no and that's why i think of it i think it's absolutely ridiculous and i hate it i hate it absolutely can't stand anything like that and there's other things out there as well like you know oh if you want to learn the guitar you've got to learn the technical aspects of the guitar first before you can play it's like What are you all about? This should be the last thing on any beginner's mind is the technical aspects of the guitar. It should be, here's Wonderwall, or here's how to play your favorite song that you want to play, not, right, okay, so this is an E, A, D, G, B string. These are all the notes, and you've got to think about, we've got harmonics on the twelve. you know, none of us care about that when you first started playing guitar. You want to be able to play the blooming thing, not understand, you know, why why the tuning is the tuning and how to tune it with harmonics and all that nonsense it, you know people don't care people want to be able to play the thing not study it you know and i hate things like that anyway breathe calm you know but like i say musician and things like that they're you, you, that that's teaching an instrument in the wrong way in my opinion uh, it's kind of forcing certain opinions on people and i don't think it helps people develop in a natural kind of way anyway i've rambled on way too long about that I might do a video on that one day just solely about musician and I'll just have a bit of a rant about it. But anyway, sorry about that, everyone. Um, moving on, to, yeah, moving on to your other question, which was uh, how much do, time do I sit in front of a TV without a guitar? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I play guitar when I want to play guitar. I don't play it all the time. I normally have a guitar with me no matter what. But you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think about it like that. I, do, I just play when I want to play. I don't have a regime or anything like that. I just play when I want to play. Uh, do my neighbours ever complain? Luckily, no. I've got very, very awesome neighbours. Led Zeppelin fans. So um, I, I'm very lucky. I'm mean, very, very lucky. Um, also, I'm not ridiculously loud either. So, um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, I hope I answered your questions. Anyway, I'm going to move on to question five now. Okay, so question five. I'm still trying to calm myself down from the musician question. Um, like I said, I really have a problem with musician, with musician and, and things like that in general. But I say that's a, that's another video for another day. So uh, number five, uh, how does John keep his guitar in tune after using the wind bar as crazy as he does? Um, more often than not, 
it's because he doesn't have a tremolo floating. The, the tremolo is flat to the body all the time, so he can only dive bomb. Um, John really doesn't kind of like um, really come up a lot with the tremolo arm. It's a lot of dive bombing. Even in the early days, you said something about 1988 and, uh, 1988 and stuff like that. I mean, and also later on, when John would go nuts with his guitar, like on an intro jam, for instance, he would immediately go and change the guitar. So, you know, it, that guitar would probably be wild. You know, his 62 Strat or his 55 Strat or, or whatever guitar he had at the intro would probably be wildly out of tune, but he just goes and changes it and for Can't Stop or or whatever the first song was, and it's back in, you know, he's, he's back in the game, so to say. But uh, most of the time, like I say, he just puts his tremolo system flat to the body, so there's no up. So you can't go up with it, you can only go down. Um... And that way too, if you break a string, your guitar's not going to go wildly out of tune as well, which is just awful. Um, especially live, it's just the most horrendous thing when you break a string with a floating tremolo live. It's just like all of a sudden you're just kind of like. <laughs> yeah, it's really not a nice thing. So, um, but mainly just what you like to say, he does. He just it's string uh, uh, tremolo flat to the body. On his 62, he had his springs set up like this, um, and the claw quite far in. Um, on his 55, he's got five springs, but I can imagine on a 55, the tremolo isn't that great. So um, he probably needs that tension just to pull it down. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's more than anything than that, because when your tremolo's flat to the body, uh, your strings are always kind of like going to return near enough. I mean, they're never going to be 100% perfect, but like they're always going to return somewhere to near enough in tune um a, a good example is the uh the, the solo he does in in japan during the uh, mother's milk tour uh where he's just he's just going mental and he's doing that kind of like mm. crazy <laughs> that kind of thing his guitar stays in tune for the entire thing and he goes into the next song with it still in tune which is really really cool but again it's just a case of Make sure your strings are stretched in nicely. Make sure the guitar is tremolo is flat to the body, and just making sure it's real. Excuse me, really settled, and the strings are really kind of like you know, like, like I say, nice and stretched. Because if they're not, you're just going to be like <laughs> after you touch the tremolo. So, um, so yeah, I mean that's how that's how I reckon you would keep it in tune as well, and just, just making sure they're really stretched in and just you know, settled, so to say. So, uh, yeah, I uh, hope that's answered your question. Uh, moving on to question six now, which is the last question of the day. Okay, okay, so I've got a bit of a sore throat from his musician rant. Anyway, um, uh, number six, do you... Oh, it actually kind of like goes um, with question three, this one. Somebody asked, uh, do you use an anchor for picking individual strings, and would I recommend it? I know you use your little finger near the middle pickup. Yeah, like I said, in for question three... It's literally just a, a personal thing. It, it's not down to I have been told to do it. It's just the way I developed to do it. I didn't. I don't think about it. I just. I just did it. It's just resting wherever my hands go, right there. Which is yeah, like you say, it's over the middle pickle. Um, like I say, that screw on my white strap is black. It's absolutely the silver, the chrome kind of like it was originally chrome covered. It's silver. It's just totally black now because my finger just... I've played it so much and the same thing's happening with Osborne here. It's, it's not very shiny, that screw, because I'm just, you know, constantly playing over it and all the sweat and dirt and whatnot from, from gigging and stuff gets in that screw and just kind of corrodes it. But, um... Anchoring your hand, like I said, it is literally just down to a personal taste. It, I mean, I, I really, you know, I can't stress that enough of anything with guitar. It's down to how you develop not how somebody tells you to develop, how you develop. What feels right to you, and the same thing goes with anything. What feels right, what sounds right, what, you know, what pedals feel right, what guitar feels right, what shape of guitar feels right, you know, down to little individual things like what strings feel right. I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you play guitar and gauge eights feel right to you, and gauge nine don't, and tens definitely don't, uh, but gauge eight strings feel really good to you, but somebody's giving you stick because they say, oh, gauge eight strings, they're wussy strings, and you know, you're not going to get the big fat tones that Steve Ray Vaughan had because you, you know, all that. 
forget that. That's not important. It's about what feels right to you, and just forget the rest. You know, I, I don't think you would convince Billy Gibbons that his gauge seven strings are wrong, or BB King that gauge nines are wrong, or Jimi Hendrix that gauge eights are wrong, or Jimmy Page that gauge eight gauge eights are wrong, or Eric Clapton. You know, you wouldn't convince them, but like, you know, well, you need gauge thirteens, or you, you know, you're just not going to get that fat tone. It's like, you know, people like. Billy Gibbons and B.B. King and Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page and Roy Gallagher used what they used because it worked for them and they didn't think about what anybody else thought or cared. But, yeah, because it really is down to, you know, that's that's what you that's what you do at the end of the day. I have had flack for years about me using a Zoom pedal. Oh, God, God. Zoom pedal. Ugh, Zoom pedals. I couldn't care less about people slagging off the fact I use a Zoom pedal, or the fact that, like, slagging off I use cheap guitars, you know, or, or this, that, and the other. I really do, and I really don't care less. Um, it doesn't bother me, because at the end of the day, it works for me. Yeah, it might not work for everybody, but it works for me, and that's all that matters. And that's the way it should be with a guitar. You should never really care about what people tell you is right or wrong. If it feels right to you, then it's right. Full stop. You know, hands down. Things change. You know, you, you, I mean, I mean, I can, I can remember a, a couple of years ago, like you know, not you know, for certain things like you know, I was, I was very kind of set in my ways at using kind of like you know, certain things like a couple of years ago, and um, that's changed now because you do change, but that's that's a given. You know, people do change. Your your tastes will change, but you should always go with what you feel. You know, I, I went down to using 50 millimeter plectrums. For, I used 60 millimeter plectrums for ages, and I went down to 50. It felt even better. And now I use both. I use either 60 or 50, and I, and I don't care either way. I can't use any thicker, and I can't use any thinner. But the 50 and 60 millimeter plectrums work for me. But people have said, you know, you, you can't, you know, you need a bigger plectrum, otherwise you're not going to get this. It's like, you know, yeah, to you that works for you, but that doesn't work for me. I, I hate big plectrums. I hate thick plectrums. I just can't. I can't stand them. You know, so again, with the whole anchor in your hand thing, it just comes down to what feels right to you, and is it comfy? You know, like like I said, it, it, even if kind of like you know, you don't, like if you don't have a guitar strap and you're just holding your guitar, you know, and that feels comfy to play like that. actually get a really cool attack actually but if that feels right you don't need a guitar strap but and that feels really right to you play like that you know you look at jeff healy um you know when he's playing sat down like this you know you couldn't tell him like oh that's a bit unorthodox you can't play like that yes he can and he did and you think he cared about what anybody thought no and it's the same thing with um all sorts of other guitarists like you know People play, you, you need to kind of play the way you feel comfiest, not the way people advise you. Sometimes advice is good, sometimes it's really negative, but you need to try things and find what works for you. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, don't persevere with it. If somebody says you need to have gauge 12 strings and you need to do this and you need to do this, and you try it and it doesn't work, don't persevere with it, change. You know, it, it, it's obviously not for you. Um, you know, you'll know straight away if something's right or if it's wrong. You will. So it's just a case of, you know, finding what works for you. And same thing with the anchor in the hand. Same with pickup preference. Same thing with down to selector switch preference. You know, everything about a guitar is down to you. It's personal to you. Not somebody else, not to Bob who lives down the road who, who says you need this and this and this and this and you need this thing. It's down to you. You know, um... And you forget the rest. You forget all the, you know, the, the you know, the, the, the back chat and this, that, and the other. You just play, and you work with what works for you, and forget the rest. Uh, I can't really stress that enough. It's really important to kind of like, you know, to, to kind of like forget what people tell you sometimes, because sometimes people can have a, a negative effect on how you play and, and what you play. Because um, everyone's kind of guilty of it, even me to an extent. I mean, I don't mind. Uh, people have told me things in the past that I've kind of stuck with, and it, it hasn't worked. So yeah, um, so yeah, I'm gonna stop 
rambling on that. I think this has been a really long Q&A, so I do apologise if it's been ridiculously long, but I hope, I hope you answered your questions okay. Like I said, just to reiterate one more time, everything about guitar is personal to you. Do what you want, not what anybody else tells you. Get the guitar you want, not what anybody else tells you. Get the pedals you want, not what people tell you. Get the setting and the sound you want to hear, not what somebody tells you. If you want it to sound like a bee in a jar, sound like a bee in a jar. If you want to sound like dark, and muddy sound like a dark and muddy if you want to sound like acdc sound like acdc forget what people tell you you should be doing and do what you want to do it's about what you want not what anybody else wants it really is it's down to that so um you know forget big corporations saying you need the six thousand pound thing you don't need that you don't need that at all okay so anyway um i'm gonna stop rambling on now i hope you enjoyed this video uh and i'll see you again for another video on friday with probably the last video uh of this year i think i might be able to get one in before new year's eve hopefully fingers crossed um but yeah anyway i hope you all have a great uh weekend no not weekend where am i i think it's musician's fault i'm telling you i hope you have a great uh, morning afternoon evening anyway and I'll see you again on Friday before I say have a good weekend again. He's tapped, I told you, he's tapped. Anyway, uh, have a great one. I'll see you again. Uh, yes, have a great morning, afternoon, evening. Goodbye now.